Well, tonight as we look at these nine glorious descriptions of our Lord Jesus Christ, I wanted to add to your notes there some descriptions here about our Lord and His name. The most common way that Jesus is referred to in the New Testament is our Lord Jesus Christ. That phrase, our Lord Jesus Christ, is found 53 times in the Bible. Now you take the word our out of it and just Lord Jesus Christ, it's found 81 times. And so that is a significant way our Lord Jesus Christ is referred to in the Word of God. And so let's understand what we mean here. When we think about Lord, Lord means and refers to his title. It refers to the fact that he is our master, owner. It's like calling him sir. Now you see the descriptions there and a little add to this just for your notes. Secondly, we see his name, Jesus. Jesus refers to his name. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And the proper understanding of Jesus, the Hebrew, it ties to the Hebrew word Yeshua or Joshua. And it means Jehovah is salvation. Well, certainly Jesus is salvation. And so we see that put together. And then the word Christ, Christ refers to his office. We often think of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king, and we're thinking about his office. It refers to him being the anointed one, the Messiah. And when Christ is combined with the word Jesus in Jesus Christ, the meaning there is Yeshua is the Messiah, or Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. So I want to put that there for your notes just so you would have it as we put this study together on these glorious descriptions of our Lord. Well, your assignment this week was to find these nine descriptions. Now, to let you off the hook a little bit, uh, if you didn't find all nine, don't worry about that. You probably found maybe six, seven, eight, probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe you just went ahead and decided something for that ninth one if you couldn't come up with that ninth one. But we're going to walk through these nine descriptions tonight and see what we have. Now, just before we get to that, notice there in your notes, just kind of scan down the way there, even open up the page and look on the inside. With the blanks are not filled in, of course, but you have a couple of common words in all these. You have he and you have is. He is now, usually the word is isn't that all, all that important to us. But here, it is very important because it speaks of present tense reality. As we think about these nine things, he is this, he is that, it's talking about present tense right now, and it's always true. And so what we're seeing here, it's not that he will be these things someday or he was these things during his earthly ministry. He is that right now. And so we want to continue on thinking along that way. Now, as I just prayed, let me share with you that what we're looking at tonight, and you're probably right now wondering how in the world we're going to get to chapter four uh, by, we're just, we're just barely into, into chapter one. We're going to get there because everything that Paul has been writing up to this point has been heading right here. And this is the central focus of the entire letter right here. And everything that he will write after this flows out of the fabric of these words. And so we want to get this all understanding, and then we're going to kind of pick up the pace, and we'll walk down the way. So let's look at these nine. First of all, he is our Savior Redeemer. Our Savior Redeemer. Notice verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you were here last week, or if you listened to a replay of the podcast, then you know we're, we're looking at a little bit of review from last time, because we studied verses 13 and 14 last time. But I, but I wanted to back up and include this in these nine descriptions, because He is our Savior Redeemer. The Jewish people always looked for their Messiah, their Savior who would come. The Samaritans, according to Deuteronomy 18, even looked for another Moses. 
So their, the look, the coming of the Messiah was what they longed for. Well, Jesus is here. We think of Jesus as Savior of the world. You probably have referred to Jesus that way, and you've heard him referred to in that way in many occasions. It is interesting to me that that phrase, Savior of the world, is found very few times in our Bible. You look it up. It's very rarely found. It's interesting that in the first century, the phrase Savior of the world was often referred to or often spoke of the emperors, the Roman emperors. They were viewed as saviors of the world. How it must have grated on the nerves of the, Rome, of the first century Christians to think of these pagan, perverted, lost emperors being referred to as savior of the world when everybody knew they were not. Well, he is our savior. He is the savior of the world. He is our savior redeemer. Notice what we see here, three things here. He delivers us from darkness. The idea of darkness here being delivered is taking us out of one domain, the domain of darkness, and translating us transplanting us, if you will. Some of you all are going to be doing some transplanting here in the next few weeks as we do some uh, work outside. Transplanting us into a new kingdom, into the kingdom of light. And the idea there of delivering us from darkness. Letter B there, he delivers us to himself. Now the idea of delivering us to himself it takes us to that word savior, redeemer, Savior means to rescue. When someone is rescued, we, we think of rescuing the perishing. Jesus is one who rescues the perishing. When we are witnesses, when we go out and we share the faith with people, we are seeking to be rescuers of the perishing, those who are dying without Christ. Well, this comes from the area of being a lifeguard. Probably somebody in our group, in our great group here, was a lifeguard at some point in your life. And, uh, of course, a lot of different ways to save someone in that sense, whether you throw a, a life preserver toward them or you throw a rope at them. Uh, the problem with that is if, if they're drowning, they're probably not uh, able to grab onto a rope. Maybe you stick a pole out there. But the most common way, of course, is what? To jump in the water with them and you pull them to yourself. That's what Jesus does. He delivers us to himself. He draws us to himself as Savior, Redeemer. As we'll come to our study in a couple of weeks, Paul said in Colossians 2, 14 through 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. He paid the penalty for us. He redeemed us. He saved us. Let us see here. He delivers us for a relationship. Now, I don't need to tell the Sunday night group this, but just so we all are on the same page, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. And he delivers us for a relationship. It's the only way. He's the only way that we can have a personal relationship with Holy God. He is our Savior, Redeemer. Well, that takes us to point two. And verse 15. Notice, let's read verse 15 together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Point number two here. He is the visible manifestation of invisible God. Now think about that. That takes us back to our first night. We think about special revelation, how Jesus is a special revelation from God. Now the word image here, he is the image of the invisible God, is the word icon, E-I-K-O-N, if you want to jot that out. Icon sounds like the icon on our computer screen. Icon actually speaks of, and it's the word image, and it actually means something that represents a greater reality or a larger reality. What we see here is Jesus, as God, is the visible 
manifestation of God. He is the way that God has revealed to us. He is the way that we can see God. He is the way that we, that we can have an experience with God. He is that visible manifestation. He reveals the Father to us. Jesus actually said himself, when you have seen me, what? You've seen the Father. And he wasn't just saying words. He was saying, when you're looking at me, you're seeing the Father. Now, let's think about that icon on your computer screen. Because that little image, and those of you that have computers at home, some of you probably have them right here with you, but you have a little icon on there, and you know that that little icon is a powerful key to unlocking a much larger computer program. In fact, those of you who are computer programmers, maybe you took a programming class in college, and, and you know a little bit about all that it takes to build in these powerful computer programs, you know even better than most of us how powerful that little icon is. Well, Jesus is the key of unlocking the greater reality of God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And what Paul is telling us here is he is the visible manifestation of invisible God. Now, what we find here, John actually tells us, listen to what John tells us in another passage in John 1.18. He says this. He says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Now that, that verse might give you some trouble. What do you mean no one has seen God at any time? If Jesus is God, and he is, and if people saw him during his earthly ministry, and they did, then how could John say no one has seen God at any time? Because Jesus was the way, encased in human flesh, was the way that they could see God and be able to live to tell about it. What they were seeing was not God. They were seeing the visible manifestation. They were seeing his flesh. They were seeing the visible manifestation of God, Jesus being very God, God of God. And they were able to see God, have fellowship with God in a personal way. How powerful that must have been. Imagine those disciples being able to walk with him, talk with him, hear him teach, hear him share knowing and, and as much as they could know. You know, even the disciples didn't understand until after the resurrection. It was still a growing experience for them. And people had the opportunity to know God personally manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. Now this word declared, where John says, he, Jesus, has declared him. We find that in John 1.18. That word declared is interesting. It takes us back to our first night of study and the word exegete. Do you remember what we talked about exegesis? We talked about hermeneutics. We talked about homiletics. And then the last of those seven words we shared at the beginning of last or our first night together was the word exegete. And we said that exegete means to draw out, to fully see something, to fully explain something. What John is telling us is Jesus exegetes God. Jesus reveals God to us in a way that we can know him, have fellowship with him. And so Jesus as God is the visible manifestation of God. Well, notice what it says here. Again, taking us back to our verse, he is the image of the invisible and God. Invisible means something that cannot be seen. Now that's a problem, usually. But with Jesus, as this tremendous work, we are able to see God. People were able to see him, have fellowship with him. So let's look at these three points there. First of all, he is invisible God. But in Jesus, by Jesus, God is made visible. And he is eternal. One of the things Jesus surrendered when he left heaven to come to earth to dwell among men was he surrendered temporarily his omnipresence. Encased in a human body, 
he limited himself to be at one place at any one time. But he never lost his eternality. He still is eternal God. So Paul wanted us to see in this tremendous picture here, Jesus as God of very God, the visible manifestation of invisible God, where men could see him, women could see him, have fellowship with him, touch him, and be able to live to tell about it. Amazing. Number three, he is the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn over all creation. Now the emphasis here is on pre-existence, uniqueness, and superiority. We think of this word firstborn, that, that, that could trouble us a little bit. If we were to take that word firstborn and use it in its natural way, uh, we would have a lot of difficulties here. Some of you all are firstborn. Some of you are the first child of your parents. Now, some of you are the only child, so you're first and only. But some of you have brothers and sisters, and so uh, they came after you, and you're the firstborn. So if we were to take that way of defining this and understand this word firstborn, we'd have difficulty. There'd be some textual problems here if Jesus is firstborn in the natural sense. Because who was the firstborn? Think back in the Old Testament. Who's the firstborn person? Actually, it's Cain. Cain's the firstborn. Uh, you have Adam and Eve, and, and Genesis 4.1 says they came together in the natural sense, and they, they had Cain. And so he's the firstborn in that natural sense many years before Jesus came to earth as, as Savior, Redeemer. Another way that, to have a difficulty with this, some people say, what does it mean firstborn? It means first created. Well, if that's what it means, then we also have, we have another problem. Who's first created? Adam. Adam. Eve second. I mean, God, the Bible tells us that, that, that the Lord God took, took dust and, and formed it into a man, breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And then out of Adam made Eve. And, and so we have these, so it couldn't be that. A third textual problem exists right here in our text because look what it says in verse 16. For by him all things were created. Well, that would mean that uh, the creator created himself. And so that's a problem. Now the idea of firstborn here then, let's just kind of cut to the understanding here. It is a beautiful picture of our Lord in his position, in his rank, in his superiority over everyone who has ever been born. He is first. The idea there is of superiority over all creation. The fact is, Jesus is 100% God, 100% man, born of a virgin, eternal God. He is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so it's talking about how his birth, even though coming many years after all these other people were born, the humanity side of our Lord being born, he is first above all, ranks first, highest of all in superiority. Notice what we have here, three points. He precedes all. Our Lord, being eternal, precedes all who have ever been born. We're going to talk about his eternal pre-existence here in just a moment. But he precedes all. Firstborn meant he's highest. He precedes all. Let her be there. He outranks all. Our Lord is highest in rank over anyone who has ever been born. He is first. First of overall is the idea there. And let her see he is sovereign over all. Look what the word says there. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is sovereign over all. That means he is Lord of all. He is number one, first place, precedes all, outranks all, is sovereign over all. 
Number four, he is our creator. Look what it says here. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Now, and we've got to read that again. And I want to read it a little more deliberately. Notice what it says there. For by him, by Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Now let's read on to verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. What we have here, thinking about all things were created by our Lord. Now this word were created, or phrase were created, speaks of a point in time. At a point in time in the past, actually before time, all things were created by him. Things that we see, visible, invisible things, did not evolve. They did not happen by some cataclysmic accident. They were created by him. He is our creator God, is what Paul is saying here. Now, one of the most powerful arguments for the existence of God to prove the existence of God is what we call cause and effect. Technically, it's called the cosmological view for the existence of God. And if you really want to impress somebody this week, just kind of lay that on them. Just talk to them about the cosmological view for the existence of God. It's, it's referred to as cause and effect. Let's think about what cause and effect really is telling us. The chair that you're sitting in tonight is a very good illustration of cause and effect. We know that that chair that you're sitting in didn't just happen. It was made. It began in the mind of a designer. Could have been a man, could have been a woman, not sure. But somebody saw that chair before it was ever made. They pulled out a piece of paper and a pencil and started sketching that chair on a piece of paper. And then there were formal drawings made up, and then there, they sent out uh, orders to get the fabric and the plastic and the wood and the metal and all the different things that make up that chair. And all that, people working together, cause and effect. Now, cause and effect says, for every effect, there's a cause. Someone, something caused that to come into being. The book of Proverbs says, surely as the ringing of the nose brings forth blood. That's a pretty good example of cause and effect. Well, what we see here is we can take that very logic of cause and effect and we can take it to the human side. We can say not only is that chair here, we also can know because of cause and effect that that, there was a designer that designed that chair and that designer had parents. Cause and effect. And those parents had parents, cause and effect. And we could just keep on going back and back and back until we get to who? We get to Adam and Eve because God created them. The Lord God formed them out of the dust of the ground, breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul, cause and effect. God got all this started. Now, for most of us, and probably for all of us, that's as far back as we need to go because we believe in God. We don't uh, doubt that reality. We know he exists. It is provable that God exists. But what if you're talking to somebody that doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in the book of God, doesn't believe in the Adam and Eve account? Cause and effect is still your friend because you can take cause and effect and just keep going back and back and back in time and through many faceless and nameless cause and effect, whatever your lost friend wants to call him, whatever he wants to call that, you can just keep going back as far as your mind will allow. But here's the way cause and effect happens. You cannot go back forever. 
your mind will not allow you to go back forever. It's just not beyond, it's not a part of our ability to do that. And eventually, you have to get to the point of an uncaused cause. A cause that has always been here, that has always existed, that got all this started. And Jesus is that uncaused cause. He's the one that has always existed. He is our creator, God. And he is the one that put all this into motion. It didn't happen by some kind of big bang or some kind of evolutionary process. God, a very God, our Lord Jesus Christ as God, a very God, our creator, started all this into motion. And cause and effect proves beyond any shadow of a doubt in the existence of God. Now, there are many other ways you can prove God's existence. We just don't have time to go into that. But what Paul is telling us here, Jesus is our creator. Look what it says there. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. The idea here is he is our creator. Let me give you three things there in your notes. Speaks of time. At a point in time, somewhere back there, as he said to Job, you weren't here when I did all this, when I got all this started, but at a point in time, our creator God got all this started. It speaks of design. He is a designer, and it speaks of intent. Just like that chair you're sitting in had a point in time when it was made by human beings. There was a design and there was intent. There was a plan. Now notice what he says here. Again, we've got to stay here a little bit longer. Verse 16. For by him all things were created. Let's stop right there. One of the early theological lessons we teach children, even at the age of three, three and a half, four years old, we have to help children understand the difference between what God makes and what man makes. We talk about, I remember my days of teaching three-year-olds with Pat. One of the things we had to help little children understand is, it's God that made the birds, the trees, the flowers, the sun, the moon. Those are some of the things that your kids are learning in Sunday school. Because they want to think, well, God made the chair and the puzzle, and the table. And we have to help them understand the difference between. And so we take that early understanding, even back as, as three-year-olds, we learn, we began to learn theology, and the difference between what God makes and what God empowers men and women to make. Well, we take that early training, and we bring it to bear in our study. Because Paul wants to clarify that God made all things, and he clarifies it by saying things in heaven and things on earth, and he qualifies it even further, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Now, when we see this uh, phraseology here of thrones and dominions and principalities and powers, we, we're actually talking about angels here and the hierarchy of angels. Actually, there are ten positions in the rank of ranks of angels or classifications of angels. And so what Paul is giving us here is not an exhaustive list of the classification or hierarchy of angels, but he is giving us a representative list and helping us to understand that Jesus is supreme. And, and this is going to come to bear in our study, but there were people in the Colossian culture who were actually in the mode of worshiping angels and principalities and powers. And what Paul is doing here as kind of a preemptive strike is saying, even God created even them, these folks that you're worshiping, these angels that you've never seen, that you claim to be worshiping, he's telling the Colossians, God created them. Well, another thing that Paul is addressing here in this account of Jesus being our creator, God, is there was a belief in the first century, kind of a first century evolution, that believed that Jesus was an emanation from God. 
that there was God, and then there were other uh, emanations and transmutations and, and evolutionary processes, and eventually Jesus became one of the created beings of God. And, and Paul is saying, hogwash, fully on that noise, Jesus is our creator, God. Notice what it says there. It is by him, it is through him, and it is for him. He is our creator, God. He called everything that's created into being, not by accident, not by evolution, not by a big bang. He is the creator. John says in John 1, 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. That's, that's pretty inclusive right there. Nothing was made except through him. Well, not only does our text say it is by him and through him, he's the instrument of creation. Even the rabbis in the Old Testament said that creation was from and by the Messiah. Well, Paul said for him. Not only is it by him and through him, it is for him. He's the goal of creation. Well, Paul could have kept on going and saying, by him, from him, through him, toward him, for him. He even could have said after him, because he says before him, before these things, he existed before all. Well, what we're finding here in our study is one of the most comprehensive Christologies of our Lord found anywhere in the Word of God. And as students of the Word of God, we would be wise to camp on these words, listen to these words, embrace these words, and have a thorough understanding of our Lord like we've never known Him before. Study these words, I want to encourage you as a student of Scripture. Well, let's notice one more thing, we've got to move on here. Let's read this 16th verse again. For by Him all things were created. Now, we said earlier that were created refers to a point in time. Well, let's read on. That are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, referring to the classification or ranks of angels. And notice, all things were created through him and for him. Now this second word created, you don't pick up on this in the English text, but this is a different word than the earlier word created. This word created speaks of permanence. Not, it doesn't refer so much as the point in time, but it's talking about that Jesus created this with permanence and with continuation and with endurance and duration. We hear a lot today on talk radio and different places, people all worried about we're going to destroy our planet. I want to tell you, we are not going to destroy this planet. If we could destroy this planet as weakling human beings, we would be more powerful than God. Our very God, our Creator God, created this planet for persistence and for endurance. We're going to talk about one day, how it's going, in a few minutes, how it's going to fall apart one day. But His creation plan is to keep it all together. And so for those who uh, go to sleep at night, worried that we're going to destroy our planet, you just need to rest your weary head because God is in control. Well, the Jesus that we serve is the God who is in control. And we can have confidence in that. We can go to sleep at night and not worry, but we just uh, rest in Him. Well, in the fifth place, He is pre-existent. Look at verse 17 here. And He is before all things. Now, our minds just will not allow us. We just can't go back and think. I mean, we, we can sort of get there. But to think about the pre-existence of God existing before things is what Paul is talking about here. Notice three items there in your outline. It refers to priority in time. He is pre-existent. Priority in rank and priority in existence. As Jesus said in John 8, 58, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Boy, that, that, just, that just caused the, the first century Jewish people just to kind of spin their heads. The, the, the Pharisees couldn't quite grasp that before Abraham was, I am. Micah said in Micah 5, 2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Jesus is preexistent. Number six, he is the sustainer of the universe. Again, look at verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now the word consist means to hold together, to cohere. When you put flour and mix in to flour oil and water and all the things that you mix in there to make dough, we talk about dough having a proper consistency. It's sticky. It sticks together. In fact, if uh, somebody that didn't know anything about how to make dough, which you can probably tell, I don't know a whole lot about it. I, I like to eat it after it's cooked, but as far as making it. But if somebody walking into your kitchen and, and seeing dough and watching you knead that and just and watching you put it on, they might think you also poured in some Elmer's glue in there, the way it sticks together. That's the word cohere. Well, you know you wouldn't put Elmer's glue in, in dough, but, but it's the way it all sticks together. That's what Paul's talking about here is our Lord is the sustainer of the universe. He causes everything to stick together or hold together. The atheists down through the years who reject God, the belief in God, the truth in God, have looked out into our universe and their question is, what keeps all this together? What causes those planets to continue year after year, decade after decade, century after century, just to continue in that orbit? What keeps our moon out there from, what just keeps it orbiting around? And, and why don't those, those planets just, just fly out on their own and just leave this orbit and go out into outer space? And since they don't believe in God, they don't believe in the book of God or the word of God, they have to come up with some kind of definition to understand how all this stays together, and their definition is cosmic glue. It's cosmic glue that keeps all these planets in their orbit. Well, they don't know what cosmic glue is. They can't recreate it in the laboratory in a test tube, but that's what they call it. Well, to our atheist friends, I want to tell you, Jesus is the cosmic glue. He is the one that keeps all this together. What Paul is telling us here is he is the sustainer of the universe. Not only is he the creator, he is the sustainer. Some folks enlisting these uh, qualifications or classification of our Lord put these in the same category, creator, sustainer. They see them as, as of course, they're together, but I see them as uh, uniquely separate. As one scholar put it, I read this this week, he is the unifying band which encompasses everything and holds it all together. He's the one. Imagine the power of our God. And what it's talking about is the dynamic power of God keeping all this in its work. We think about him maybe and think about the Philharmonic. He's the conductor guiding all of this that's going on with his dynamic hand. And we are his instruments, playing the symphony with him. But now as he the conductor, he is the symphony. He's the reason why all this is here. It is by him and through him and for him, and he's the one that keeps it all going. It's by him that all things consist. Imagine how ridiculous for the Pharisees to question him. Think about Pilate, as will probably be caused to think about those words of Pilate just before our Lord was crucified, where Pilate said, do you not know I have power to crucify you and power to release you? 
Jesus must have thought in his heart, you don't have any power at all unless I give it to you. I'm the one that gives you your power. Imagine how blasphemous the devil saying, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. How ridiculous. As the psalmist said, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. When you, look, when you think about God looking down on people on earth who think they are so powerful, and think they are so important, he must laugh to realize how small we are compared to his greatness and his goodness. Well, three things here. There's so many ways we could summarize him being the sustainer of the universe. First of all, he makes gravity work. Now, sometimes we kind of wish gravity didn't work. When that jug of milk falls off the kitchen table and you've got all that mess on the floor, you kind of wish gravity didn't work but it does and he's the one that makes gravity work he didn't make the jug of milk fall over but he makes gravity work and certainly it works in our favor many many times he holds planets in their orbits he is the sustainer and he holds everything together jot down if you would there hebrews 1 3 hebrews 1 3 says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Think of the strength of that. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Now we think about being a sustainer of the universe, and we talk about this planet being created for endurance and persistence and continuance. Yet we know the Bible says, in fact, the apostle Peter wrote about a time where he says this, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, even though it was created for endurance and persistence and continuance, there's coming a day when even this planet will cease to be. All of it, as the Bible says, it will melt with fervent heat. We can read in the book of Revelation what God is going to do to bring all that to pass. But it is, it is equally biblically accurate to say that he really doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is stop doing what he's doing right now. Right now, dynamically, our Lord God is keeping all of this together. And all he has to do is release his hands and it will all fall apart and fly apart and melt. As the Apostle Peter says, it'll melt with fervent heat. Given that as truth, the Apostle Peter went on to say, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, he's a sustainer of the universe. He holds it all together. Number seven, he's the head of the church. He's the head of the church. Notice verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. Now, there's a lot of things we could say about this, and we are church-going people. We love the church. We know that Jesus Christ died for the church. Several things we want to include here. It speaks of time. He is the one that created, started the church. He even told the disciples, I will build my church. Sometimes in seminary, we get to talk about 
who actually started the church? Well, it, it shouldn't be that big. I mean, you should be able to answer that question in about 30 seconds. Jesus is the one. He is the head of the church. Speaks of time. It speaks of power. He's the one that got all this started. It speaks of ownership. This church is his. It's interesting. You, you see some different churches, they might have a a predecessor's name on it. There's, I know in Fort Worth, Texas, I don't know if it still is there, but it used to be called the, the B.H. Carroll Baptist Church. Well, it was uh, given that name, B.H. Carroll was the first president of the South, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, one person that I had talked to about that one time, he said, you, look, you can kind of look around, there's never been a church that has anybody, any human's name on it. It's really been very successful because it's the Lord's church. We might want to honor men. We can honor them by maybe putting their picture in the foyer or something because they're, God used them in an amazing way, but it's the Lord's church. It's His. Ownership is His. It also speaks of position. He is the head of the church. You think about the head on your body. You wouldn't get to go very far without your head. And He is the head. He's the significant leader of the church. It's his. And letter E, it speaks of source. Jesus is the source of all that we need as a church. You probably have room for all this, but I put a few extras here just to, let me give you just a few words if you want to jot them down. First of all, power. As our source, he gives us all the power that we need to grow spiritually and numerically. As, as a pastor of a church for, for many years, in different churches, one of the things we always sought to do was, was reach more people and to grow the people that were attending. The, he is the source of that power. He is wisdom. He's the source of wisdom. He gives us all the wisdom that we need. There's so much that we try to do sometimes without his wisdom, but he is the source of wisdom. Protection is another word you might want to write down. He's the source of the protection that we need against the enemy who would seek to do us harm. He's the source of power and authority. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, All power has been given unto me. Go therefore and teach the nations. Go therefore and make disciples. He is the source of power and authority. He is the source of life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He's the source of nourishment. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he's the source of direction. He's the source of leadership and oversight. And as we as a church, as we continue to march forward, under the banner of Lord Jesus Christ as our head. He is the source of all that we need. And as we stay submitted to him, following him, we will experience his blessing. Well, number eight, he is the firstborn from the dead. Now we got go back to firstborn now. We got, a, we got this again. Look, verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. Here again, what Paul is saying is, he's first. Of all who have been and will be brought back to life, he's first. Now when you think about it, there are a lot of different people who have been brought back from the dead. I don't know if I have an exhaustive list here of those in the Bible, but there's the widow's son who was raised by Elijah. There was the Shunammite woman's son who was raised by Elisha. There was the man who was raised from the dead because he touched Elisha's bones. There was Jairus' daughter who was brought back. There was the widow's son of Nain. Remember, he was in the coffin and Jesus stopped and taught, touched the coffin and he comes back. There's Lazarus. Dorcas was raised by Peter. There was Eutychus, who was raised by Paul. Remember that guy fell out of the window from Paul preaching all the way into the night. Guy falls out of the, he falls asleep, falls down dead, and Paul brings him back. What, have, what do all these people have in common? 
they all had to die again. Jesus is first in the sense that nobody before him was resurrected. All those folks were resuscitated. Jesus was resurrected from the dead to receive a glorified body, never to die again. In fact, the Bible's telling us there's coming a day when we're going to get a body like that. The dead in Christ shall rise first. But Jesus, of all who will be resurrected from the dead, he is first, is what Paul is saying. And so letter, letter A there, let's notice here. Priority over all in time first is what he's talking about. Priority over all in time. Letter B, supremacy over all in rank and so far uniqueness compared to all. His body was and is an immortal body and one day we will receive a resurrected body, an immortal body. Well, number nine, he is the preeminent one. Look at verse 18. We've got to read this one more time. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now, preeminence, or being the preeminent one, really is a way to summarize all these other eight statements that we've made. He is the preeminent one. When Paul wrote what he wrote in these words, he was headed for saying this, that Jesus is the preeminent one. And gang, everything that we talk about from here on out is going to flow out of this truth that he is the preeminent one. Go with me as we close to Philippians chapter 2. Let's let this be our concluding thought together. As Paul talked about all these truths of our Lord, Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Let's let this mind be in us. Let this mind be in you. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which also was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And, found, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The tremendous truths here about our Lord. Well, your assignment this week is this. I want to encourage you to read through chapter 1 of Colossians several times if possible. Take what you have studied, what we have learned so far, and read through the of chapter 1 of Colossians. We're going to complete chapter 1 next week, and then the next Sunday night, our night before we take our Easter break, we're going to do chapter 2, and so we're right on course. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, what, a, what powerful thoughts we've experienced tonight. Powerful truths we've experienced tonight. Our Lord Jesus Christ, these nine glorious descriptions of him. Father, I pray that as we go home, as we rest this evening, even as we rise in the morning, may our minds be focused on the tremendous power, significance, authority, position, sovereignty of our Lord. Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for dying for us, for paying our sin debt, for transferring us and transplanting us out of the domain of darkness and into the marvelous light of your truth. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for being 
our Savior, our Redeemer. Father, I pray that as we leave here tonight, you'll give us safety as we go. Give us a good night of rest and prepare us for a new day tomorrow. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Good night.